Hey guys, and welcome back to our third unscripted video, Pickle Dragon Unscripted. Um, this time I'm going to talk about something that uh, we talked about a little bit. Well, we talked about the psychological effects of a TPK during our GaryCon panel, and I kind of wanted to expound on it a little bit more. Um, because uh, there's, there is, I get the feeling that uh, there is a strong um, aversion of, for t of DMs towards TPKs. And yes, you don't want to just massacre your players outright on purpose. Um, but... Back in at Gary Content, I was on. I got to sit in on a panel with Skip Williams, and the subject of TPKs came up. And Skip was like, to the question, the person posing the question about TPKs, he, they asked, "What do you think of TPKs?" Skip said, "He turned it around. He said, well, what do you think?'" And he and the and the person said, "I think it's a complete failure on the part of the DM any TPK." And I was like, I kind of laughed, and Skip kind of laughed, and and uh, there was there were there was many people in the crowd that was kind were kind of laughing because, um, I guess by that definition, no matter what the players do, no matter what the players do, it's always the fault of the DM when there's a TPK. So the last TPK I had, I was running Temple of Elemental Evil, uh, upgraded. To fifth edition, and it was a fairly large table. I didn't think there would be a TPK because it was an open table at a game store, and so I I had never thought, oh, this, this group is so big. I think there was like eight or nine players. They're probably going to do pretty well, smashing through it. So. Um, one of the things that they would do is they thought it was hilarious. Every door they came across, they had to kick open. Well, if you guys, if you know anything about the temple, you know there's all the different factions inside the temple. And uh, without giving any spoilers, uh, nothing unifies uh, a group of bad guys better than an outsider trying to, to you know, wedge their way into their turf. So, when they started kicking in doors and making their presence known, the bad guys started setting traps and ambushes. And the first few, I kind of gave as a as a warning. You know, if you keep doing this, they're gonna these guys are gonna get you. And you know, there was uh, some guardian nagas, some ghouls that laid a trap. There was another guy that had these trained owl bears that laid a trap, and they defeated them. And finally. They, the party made their way into the water cult sanctum, the actual inner sanctum of the water cult, kicked the door open, of course, because they kicked in every door, and there was no one in there. So eventually, the first guy walked in the room, and I said, okay, we're going to roll initiative. And that first guy was, was a fighter type. I don't remember what archetype he was, but he was a fighter type. And he won initiative, and the bad guys went second, and the rest of the party fell behind. So he's like, I charge into the room. Well, essentially, the water cult was able to split the party up into a bunch of small little groups. And, uh, yeah, it did. Ironically, the, the fighter who charged into the room was the last to fall. Um, but... The party still brought it on themselves, even though they had been split up and just defeated piecemeal. Um, they they still had. <laughs> it could have even gone even better for them because the there was a, a bard in the party who had a wand of wonder, and he you tried to use the wand of wonder to break open a uh, a hole where they could regroup and and. Uh, but he kept rolling fireballs. He used the water water twice, and he rolled the exact same result twice, and fireballed the party twice. So, you know, the party was split up. They nuked themselves twice, um, and eventually they all died. That was the last TPK I had. Um, 
now no one got upset you know no one no one accused me of picking on them or doing anything to that effect but they uh they all i think they all learned from it though and they became better players because of it you know the the door kicking open stopped um the idea the the wand of wonder which which uh was an item that they all thought was absolutely hilarious and they used all the time um later several months later they got another one and they were kind of like i don't know if we should be let's just make sure and cast it way over there you know they learned from the tpk they became better players tactically um and even out of combat you know when they were sneaking about dungeons and whatnot they were much more careful um they worked together better so yeah you know I, I don't think TPKs are bad things, you know, especially when the when the party brings it upon themselves. Um, I've had what, two or three TPKs since fifth edition came out. I actually find fifth edition easy to TPK a party, um, mostly because of healing word. You know, I've heard I've heard the argument that uh, that you know, well, it's healing is super easy in in fifth ed, fifth ed. And for that simple fact alone, monsters, particularly intelligent monsters, would react accordingly. If they know that there's a guy from 30 feet away who can heal, you know, they're going to be more apt to, to, to double tap the guy who just fell on the ground in front of them than they are to run away and, and just let that person from 30 feet away heal them and let them pop up behind them. So, you know... I I actually find 5e, you know, if, if you think about it from that aspect, to be kind of rough on players. But, you know, if it all depends on the DM style, I guess. Um, in any case, I did mention I did mention that um, I was going to share with you some of the some of the swag that came in from Gary Khan. I had some shirts come in, but. Um, you know, those are on Instagram. I showed those off on Instagram, the art on those. But uh, Larry Elmore did one of the shirts this year. It was pretty damn cool. I'll, I'll show you the art. It's on the coin here. Uh, but one of them um, is the Thunder Frost Dragon. It's a big pewter miniature. It's really big. Um, thing weighs up quite a bit. It's going to require a lot of pinning to put together. I generally don't put them together. I usually just... They're collector's items to me, so I just keep them in their box. Here was the previous year, John Popson. He does them seemingly, I think he does them every year, effing cool miniatures. He, he did this, the the uh, Pirate Queen the previous year with the Yuan T. Um, there's, it's kind of, the Pirate Queen has all this treasure, and the Yuan T sneaking up behind her. Um, but the dragon, man, this thing's huge. It's a. It's a cross between a white and a blue dragon, a hybrid dragon, which I actually, I love the idea of, of hybrid dragons. In third edition, I had it in the campaign. Um, I had a part silver and part blue dragon that played a prominent role. I think it's just kind of something that's cool. But I, one of the things I love about this is that John sculpted dragon eggs, and I don't know if you can see them there. They look like little pineapples. I mean, it is no wonder why dragons are so, so absolutely honoring all the time. If that's what, if that's the kind of thing that they have to squeeze out, boy, dragon eggs all spiky like that sounds like an awful thing. But onto the coin, this thing is closer to a dinner plate than a coin. But here it is, the Larry Elmore art on it, and of course. The reverse side, they only do a coin every other year. The reverse side is always the previous year's art. Now, check this out, though. Look at the size difference between these two coins. This is, these are the coins from previous years, right here. And they are pretty small. Sorry if I didn't show them quite well. So well there, I was kind of losing my balance. But pretty small compared to this honker. And this thing's not even in a case yet, so... Yeah, it's gonna. It's uh, pretty big. Um, 
But I love them. I love collecting the coins. The Gary Con swag has always been something I've really enjoyed. Every year they have an official adventure that Luke Gygax helps write. Uh, that hasn't come in yet, but I'll share it when it does. Uh, last year it was the Pirate Queen. She had a flying ship. Um, but, uh, oh, you guys had a question. And actually, I've still got a backlog of questions, but I want to answer this one this week. And that is, there. I guess some of you, some DMs out there who really do want to run a serious game. Um, and of course, you know, you can always talk to your players if you feel like the goofing off gets to be a little too extreme at the table. But, you know, there's always going to be goofing off and ribbing and having fun at, at a gaming table. That's part and partial to it. Um, but how do you keep the players from goofing off in a very tense role play situation? Uh, I do have a, have a trick I use. Um, when we're in a role playing situation, when the, particularly an important NPC or, um, one a big villain. I mean, nothing can undercut the the impact of a good villain than when people are just goofing off during during their introduction or during their monologue. Um, but in any case, one of the things I do is that during those role play situations, anything you say, the player says at the table during that role play situation, your character actually says. And that has that has bit so many of my players in the butt in the past. Um, my favorite one was we we were running the Drow series, the old first edition Drow series. We we were actually playing second ed, but we were running the Drow series, the first ed Drow series, Vault of the Drow, the Demon Queen of the Demon Web Pits, and all that stuff. And like most adventures, it. It doesn't go as scripted, you know. The party, the party had gotten uh, distracted by a number of other things going on in the adventures, and and at some point, they actually asked for an audience with Loth and were granted it. And one of my players decided this was the time to mouth off to Loth, to pop off and and be a jerk to Loth. And he was he was like, ah, you know, I'm so funny, and people at the table. They knew the rules and infected the eyes were going around, you know, what's the DM going to do? So the party couldn't really do anything about it, but Loth had him drug away. And they didn't see him for days. And when he turned back up, he was the first human to be given the Drider treatment, at least in my campaign. So he had become a Drider. So uh, it, it played it played big into role-playing interactions in the future. Uh, going into cities, he, being a drider, that was a big problem for him. Um, so it was, it was, he thought it was cool at first until he tried to go into the first shop and it just wasn't so cool then. Um, so, I mean, and, and, you know, you don't have to use that mechanic if you don't want to. Um, sometimes you just say, hey guys, come on, let's, uh, let's keep it serious now or, you talk to your players beforehand. If you know something big's going to happen, you can talk to everyone beforehand and say, "All right, let's try to keep it serious this week," or um, or whatever. You know, you, you really just need to address whatever the problem is and and go from there. Because it, sometimes it's not just what the players do. Sometimes maybe the players are just always distracted. You know, I find the more tactical players, the players who like to to really grind the, the mechanics out of their characters are less interested in role play typically. It's not always true. Don't hold me to that, please. But and vice versa, the players who are more interested in, in role play aren't necessarily as interested or paying much attention during combat. So, you know, it's you just have to address the problem. You know, what is the problem? You know, what is it that that you're struggling your table struggling with that's not keeping their attention and then you address it, you know. So, in any case, um, now, one element of the mechanic I didn't tell you was that if you wanted to speak out of character, you had to stand first. So you stand up. And, you know, that's the signal. Oh, I'm going to say something out of character. 
So you got to give them that out. Yeah. But in any case, uh, I'm going to wrap this one up now. We had a video during the week, and I try not to keep these too long. But uh, if you want to submit any questions, you can submit them below uh, in the comments, or you can email me, uh, M-A-T-T-R-A, at thepickledragon.com. Um, you can also go to my website and submit an email that way. Or you can go on Instagram and submit questions that way. I'm always happy to answer more. I've got a backlog, but I'm always happy to get more. One of these days, I'll just do a, a video or I try to get the backlog out. Um, in the meantime, please subscribe and hit the little bell for notifications. And happy gaming. And as always, be heroic.